So thank you very much for joining us today for um, the AIUK public meeting in Norwich. And my name is uh, Michael Holmberger. I'm the Professor of Applied Dementia Research here at the University of East Anglia in Norwich, if you don't know me. And we have a fantastic panel today uh, consisting of Dr. Claire Bromley from Alzheimer's Research UK, Dr. Wendy Hardeman from the University of East Anglia and Professor Blair Goodman from the University of Hertfordshire. And so just to start with a bit of housekeeping, um, I think um, what you will just see us and hear us in, in, in our videos and uh, audio links. So we've muted you all. So this is just to help the speaker being uh, giving a presentation without being interrupted. But what I'm going to do, I'm going to share quickly uh, my screen and give you um, an introduction how you can ask questions in particular, which is a, a really important. So hopefully you see this all now. Oops. Right. So what you can see, so yes, so thank you again for being here. What I'm going to show you is we, our program will look as follows. We have first Dr. Claire Bromley from Alzheimer's Research UK giving a brief overview of what Alzheimer's Research UK does and, um, and um, the impact COVID had on AI UK. Then Dr. Wendy Hardeman will talk about supporting behavior and change for healthy aging. And after her presentation, there will be a Q&A, so you will have a chance to ask questions and I'll show you in a minute how you can do that. And finally, we have Professor Claire Goodman from the University of Hertfordshire. will talk about her DEMCOM study, which is the National Evaluation of Dementia-Friendly Communities, reaching out or bringing in. And again, after that, there will be a, a Q&A, so if you have any questions, you can ask them then. So how do you ask questions? There are three ways really how we uh, allow you to ask questions. One is if you go to the bottom of your screen in Zoom, you will see there is a Q&A button. If you open that, uh, you can see that um, you will basically will open another window and you can type in your questions in that window, press send and it will be sent. You can also tick send anonymously if you don't want to provide your name. And in the Q&A, we will go through the questions in the Q&A you have typed in. So you can do that even when people are talking, it doesn't interrupt them. The second way is you can raise your hand. And this is again at the bottom of the panel, you can see there is a click raise hand in your controls. And uh, we will see that you've raised your hand. And uh, once we know you've raised your hand, you just wait until we are basically unmute you and you will get a message which tells you uh, that we would like to unmute your microphone and you need to uh, basically confirm that and then you can speak and ask your question and after that we mute you again and please lower your hand again so we keep track whose uh, question has been answered you can of course raise your hand again to ask another question then. and finally there is a chat function in again in the, in the control bar of zoom so again, if you wanted to uh, have a question, but ideally the chat should be only used to make comments or suggestions with everyone in the meeting. So please use more the Q&A or raise your hand function for this, but we are also checking quickly the chat functions. So I hope this gives you a good overview of um, what basically, um, how you can ask the question, the quick program, what we're going to, um, what's going to happen today. And, um, Yes, if you have any other questions, you can always email us in the meantime as well to our email address, which is dementia.research at uea.ac.uk. And again, we can put this in the chat for you. And so if you have any problems technically, just let us know. Just to finally say at the end, we will have a feedback form. So it's really important for us that you complete the feedback form if you can, it's very brief just to give us an overview what worked, what didn't work in this format, because the first time we're doing this, of course, online. And finally, just to say that this meeting is recorded. Uh, so if you don't want to be your question uh, be in the recording, which we'll be later putting up on our website, please let us know again via the email address and we can edit your question out. 
Right, and without further ado, I will hand you over to Dr. Claire Bromley. Uh, so Claire, if you could share your screen and presentation with us. Sorry, it's currently saying that screen sharing has failed to start, so I'll just try again a second. That looks better. Okay, can you see the slides okay? We have at the moment your slideshow view, not the... Sorry, one second. Okay, can you see the slides now? Yes, perfect. Brilliant, thank you very much. Sorry about that, everyone. It always takes a bit of that extra technical um, hitches at the beginning. So I'm Claire and I'm part of the team at Alzheimer's Research UK. And what I want to talk to you just a little bit before we hand over to the scientists is some basic background about dementia and also some information about what Alzheimer's Research UK are doing. So Alzheimer's Research UK is the UK's leading dementia research charity, dedicated to making life-changing breakthroughs in diagnosis, prevention, treatment, and cure. And we fund research across the UK, including in Norwich. And this singular focus on research means that we can channel our expertise for maximum benefit to power pioneering science that will change lives. So what's the impact of dementia in the UK? So there are estimated to be 850,000 people living with dementia in the UK, with the set to reach 1 million by 2021. What this means on a personal level is that one in two of us know someone with the condition. Dementia costs the UK economy 26 billion each year, with much of this through social care as there are limited treatments for dementia. This cost is more than the cost of cancer and heart disease combined. When we compare what's spent on research, six times more is spent on cancer research than dementia research. And we know that funding for cancer research has really revolutionized the way that cancer is diagnosed and treated, and it's led to cancer survival rates doubling over the last 20 years. We want to see the same for dementia as investment in dementia research will lead to those life-changing breakthroughs. So what is dementia? The words Alzheimer's and dementia are often confused with each other, but they aren't interchangeable. The dementia itself is not a disease. It's a collection of symptoms, including a decline in memory, reasoning and communication skills, and the ability to do day-to-day -day tasks. And these symptoms are caused by physical diseases, including Alzheimer's disease, frontotemporal dementia, dementia of Lewy bodies, and vascular dementia. Alzheimer's disease is the most common cause of dementia, accounting for around two thirds of dementia cases. And at Alzheimer's Research UK, we're funding research into all the different causes of dementia. So the symptoms of dementia occur due to physical changes that take place in Alzheimer's and other forms of dementia. And these changes are, delivered, are sorry, driven by biological processes. These biological processes include the buildup of toxic proteins in the brain, such as the formation of amyloid plaques and tau tangles in Alzheimer's. And there are also changes to blood flow in the brain. These changes then trigger other processes to go wrong, meaning that nerve cells can no longer do their job properly and they become damaged and die. This loss of cells means that the brain starts to shrink with the damage becoming more widespread as the dementia spreads through the brain. And the symptoms that people experience vary depending on the area of the brain that is damaged. And the reason that I just put an orange on the slide is because of the damage to the brain in Alzheimer's can leave it weighing 140 grams less than a healthy one, which is about the weight of an orange. 
Researchers now understand that these processes can go wrong for up to two decades before someone starts to show the symptoms of dementia. This presents challenges not only to the doctors trying to diagnose dementia, but also to researchers who are studying the brain and trying to find new ways to diagnose and treat the condition. So there are currently four drugs available specifically to treat Alzheimer's. But they can sometimes help people with other forms of dementia as well. These drugs help with the symptoms, so they're known as symptomatic treatments. They are not able to slow or stop the disease processes that lead to nerve cells dying. So often these drugs stop becoming effective after a year or two. These drugs work by boosting communication between our nerve cells, specifically at the connection points between nerve cells called synapses. And this communication is essential for everything that we think, feel or do. And at Alzheimer's Research UK, we're funding research into life-changing treatments. As well as researching and doing drug discovery work, it's essential to also look into early diagnosis methods. This is because the treatments being developed for diseases like Alzheimer's are likely to be most effective if we can give them to people earlier. So dementia is caused by physical diseases. A damage to the brain gets worse over time. In dementia, the appearance of symptoms can occur up to two decades before these brain changes start happening. Currently, people are diagnosed with dementia when they start experiencing symptoms. And we want to be able to detect brain changes earlier and are funding research into this early diagnosis. As while reversing damage to the brain is a huge ask, getting in early and preventing dementia is a real possibility. And we know that treatments stand the best chance of success if we can spot these earliest signs of damage. And one of the reasons scientists think that clinical trials may have been unsuccessful in the past is because potential treatments have been given too late. We also want to understand dementia risk as if we could delay the onset of dementia by just five years, there would be a third fewer people living with the condition by 2030. So we know that the majority of dementias arise due to a really complex interaction between our genetics, our age, our lifestyle and our environment. And scientists are try starting to find out how these different factors can interact with each other and affect our risk of developing dementia. In fact, recent research showed that 33% of dementia cases could be due to risk factors in our power to change. So whilst it's unlikely that there's going to be one single thing that we can all do to prevent dementia, by understanding the key factors, we hope to be able to learn whether there are simple steps that we can all take to reduce our risk. So the best current evidence suggests that what's good for your heart is good for your head. The things that keep your heart healthy, like keeping active, exercising, eating a healthy diet, help look after your brain health as well. However, it's really important to note that someone could live a very healthy lifestyle but still get the condition. Loneliness has been linked with dementia and Alzheimer's Research UK are funding a new study exploring the impact of social isolation measures on older people at an increased, increased risk of coronavirus. This study will follow up volunteers from a large established study of ageing in the UK. They would talk to these volunteers to find out how these isolation policies are perceived and how they've affected their mental health, well-being, general health and the use of social care. This subset of the population has been re hit really hard by the pandemic and have been following social isolation guidance and may have been taking extra precautions. However, throughout the pandemic, there have been really positive stories of the support local communities have been giving each other. And as part of the study, the researchers will explore how the support from others, including neighbours, has changed in the current situation to how it was in the past. Also, technology has provided new ways to keep in touch and see friends and family, virtually when the country was in lockdown. The scientists were asked to what extent this crisis has led to people using this new and unfamiliar technology. By supporting top scientists to conduct research like this is essential as it will help inform future decisions on how to combat loneliness and possibly reduce the burden of this virus on people at risk of dementia. 
COVID has also impacted dementia research. The university sites are mostly closed and researchers are working from home or on furlough. This has meant that research looks quite different in this period, but our scientists have been busy analysing data, reading about the latest research findings, writing about the discoveries they've made, and planning and prioritising for when they can return to the lab. We even held our annual conference virtually over Twitter, which was a great way for scientists to share ideas while they weren't able to meet in person. Excitingly, researchers are slowly being able to return to the lab, but this looks very different to how it did previously, with labs only being able to operate at around 20% capacity to ensure government guidelines can be followed. During this time, we've also supported our clinical researchers to work for the NHS. So while observational studies have been put on hold, clinical trials are still continuing as best they can as a clear benefit for them going ahead. Researchers have been really innovating to do tests over the phone to reduce the face-to-face -face contact required during this period. And as researchers are starting to return to the lab, it's really vital to keep up the momentum in dementia research. We need the support of the public more than ever, and are incredibly grateful to those who've been able to continue to support us during this challenging time. However, as a charity, we're predicting an income drop of 45% this year. So we've furloughed about half our staff to help protect the charity's finances, but we've had to pause funding for new research until we're clear on the full impact of this pandemic. This means that at the moment, we're unable to fund all the vital research that we'd normally be able to. Also as a charity, we've been working really hard to continue the things we would usually do where possible. So our Dementia Research InfoLine team have been working remotely to answer questions from the public. So you can get in touch with the team to get free information about dementia and dementia research and also order free health information booklets on the website. They're entirely free of charge, including postage. We're also part of a service called Join Dementia Research. So if you're interested in getting involved in vital dementia research, you can get in touch with the team to find out more or sign up online. You don't need to have a di dementia diagnosis to get involved in the research. And there are studies, particularly online studies, that are still continuing during this period. We also work hard to ensure everyone has access to information. So some projects have had to be put on pause and we've had to do things a little differently to adapt to working from home, such as virtual events like this one today. You can also find out more about the diseases that cause dementia and the latest research findings by following us on social media and browsing our news pages, blog and website. We know that the government currently have a huge task on their hands, but coronavirus is having a huge impact on people with dementia and dementia is still going to be here after coronavirus. We're calling on the government to recognise that dementia needs to remain a public health priority. We desperately need funding from the government and we're working out how we can hold them to account for their election promise to double dementia research funding just as soon as we can. If you want to get involved in campaigning, you can find out more on our website. So as a charity, supporters are absolutely vital to the work that we do. And as I've said, dementia research isn't immune to the effects of the pandemic and the future is incredibly uncertain. The prediction of the drop in the amount of funds available to us to support dementia research will have huge knock-on effects and we're really grateful for any support that you're able to give. We do know that not everyone is able to donate during this time but there are other ways that you can support us. As well as campaigning and opportunities to volunteer you could consider fundraising for us. With many fundraising events being cancelled our incredible supporters have come up with innovative ways to fundraise our virtual cycling down dementia and run down dementia events are still ongoing. And Professor Michael Holmberger cycled the distance of Land's End to John O'Groats, so the entire length of the UK just from his living room. And virtual quizzes have also been incredibly popular. We have a mighty quiz pack to help you run your own from home and a huge idea, range of ideas for fundraising on our website. Thank you so much for listening. And I'll now hand over to the scientists to tell you more about their work. Thank you very much, Claire. That was a fantastic overview. We have actually one question for you, uh, which I'm not sure you can see it yourself in the Q&A box. Um, we can read it to everybody. So it's from Katie Foster. She says, I've been involved with AUK for a few years. The numbers of people living with dementia seems to have been stuck at 850,000 for some time. Yeah. I'm sure it must have increased by now. It would 
help us volunteers to have the most up-to-date number if all possible. By the way, a word of sincere thanks to all of you for what you're doing. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much for your message. So the 850,000 comes from a um, report that was commissioned a few years back. And it is true that we're likely to be between that 850,000 and that 1 million figure that was predicted for 2021. Obviously, these predictions are quite hard to get exactly right, but I'd imagine by next year, we'll be using that figure of a million people living with dementia in the UK. Great, fantastic. Thank you very much, Claire. Thank you. If you put yourself on mute, and then we're going next to uh, Wendy Hardman. And um, over to you, Wendy, please, if you could share your screen and talk us your, through your presentation. Right, everyone able to see my screen? Yes, we can see Great. it. Good, good. Thank you, Michael. And thank you so much for the invitation to speak today. And it's a real pity that I can't meet you all in person, but thank you very much for joining uh, online this afternoon. Uh, so Claire gave a very good introduction actually to my talk. She was talking about the importance of behavior and behavior change to reduce the risk of dementia. And indeed, you know, to reduce the risk of uh, most common long-term conditions. Um, so I'm going to talk about supporting behavior change for healthy aging. And uh, I'm a behavioral scientist, uh, so I'm really in interested in understanding uh, behaviors like physical activity and healthy eating and helping people um, sort of doing research to uh, promote uh, healthy behavior change. So I'm a member of the, uh, let me just see. Yep, okay. So I'm a member of the Behavioral and Implementation Science Group and my uh, very close collaborators are on this slide, Sarni Kachisari and Felix Norton. And our, our research group focuses on two key areas. The first one is promoting uh, healthy behaviors, for instance, physical activity, uh, healthy diets. Uh, Felix is doing a lot of work on smoking cessation, particularly in pregnancy. And Sani is interested in uh, reducing harmful drinking. So between us, we cover sort of all the, what we call the big four behaviors. And we develop uh, behavior change interventions or programs to promote these healthy behaviors and evaluate or test in big research um, uh, programs, whether, they, uh, whether people can change behavior and whether that has a positive effect on uh, health outcomes. And secondly, our group is interested in promoting the routine delivery of evidence-based practices in practice and policy. And that sounds a bit complicated, so I will explain that. Um, there's a lot of interventions, a lot of um, in behavior change programs that we know work. So for instance, we know that brief interventions to reduce harmful drinking uh, actually help people to drink less. And despite that, actually, the NHS is not routinely offering uh, these interventions. So particularly, Zani is interested in um, trying to promote the things that we know work into routine care and policy, both in the NHS and social care. So that's a bit about our group. Um, so in the next half an hour, I'm going to talk about three topics. Uh, I'm first going to talk about uh, what works in supporting behavior change. I'm then going to talk about two uh, research programs that I've been involved in. The first one around very brief behavior change interventions. So these are sort of five minutes uh, brief behavioral uh, behavior change advice in primary care. And this is around physical activity. And then finally, I'm going to talk about using group sessions for behavior change. And this is a study which is uh, funded by Alzheimer's Research UK which is looking at promoting the Mediterranean diet and increasing physical activity to reduce the risk uh, of dementia. Okay, so um, behavior change is really important for healthy aging. And there was a very big study in Norfolk, um, I think still ongoing, the Epic Norfolk study. Thousands of people are involved in that and maybe some of you. Um, and that study showed that if people are able to sort of adopt four healthy behaviors. So there's to stop smoking if they do and become physically active, uh, to eat a healthy diet 
and not to drink, too much, drink alcohol too much, on average, that could actually uh, add 14 years to their life expectancy. So people on average could live 14 years young, uh, uh, longer. So that's a huge um, benefit that could be uh, gained. And um, looking at dementia as well, there is, as Claire was saying, we, we know that uh, healthy lifestyles can uh, decrease the risk of developing dementia. And uh, this is an article in The Guardian about a study that was done uh, among, I think, 8, 000, uh, 20, no, 200,000 people, actually, the UK Biobank study, that showed that if uh, people adopt a healthy lifestyle, they can reduce their risk of developing dementia by a third. And this was uh, irrespective of whether they, you know, their genes put them uh, at a higher risk of dementia. Okay, so behavior change, really important. And... I think we behavior change has been really on the fore in the last uh, um, three months or so. We've all had to make massive changes in our behavior wherever we live and whoever we are. Uh, we've had to sometimes, you know, not being able to eat the things that we wanted because it was hard to find, um, you know, to, the right products in a supermarket. Rather than meeting with people, we had to have dinner over Zoom. A lot of us uh, have been doing more exercise at home uh, rather than outside. And of course, we've all been asked to uh, socially distance. So uh, massive changes in our behavior. So I think it's all, uh, you know, it's in the forefront of all our minds. So um, I'm gonna start first by talking about what works in uh, supporting behavior change. And I'll just leave you to read this uh, cartoon for a, for a second. So this is an approach that we know from research is not very helpful to scare people and to say, if you're not changing your behavior, you could die uh, early and telling people what to do, telling people that they need to change. We know that this is not um, a good way or a, effective way to support behavior change. So how can we do better? And I think my first key message this afternoon is that we need to understand what influences people's behavior before we can support them with behavior change. Uh, we need to know what the problem is before we can you know, help people to come up with uh, solutions. And I'm gonna show um, a simple model, a fairly simple because there are many complicated behavior change theories out there. This is called the COMBI model, um, capability, opportunity, motivation, and behavior. And this was developed by Susan Mickey and, and colleagues. And it basically says there are three key influences on our behavior, our capability to do the behavior, our motivation, and the opportunity to do it. And quite often in sort of common language, we, we think it's all about motivation. That's if we only have the willpower to change, it will happen. And often if we try to change our behavior and we don't succeed, we blame ourselves and we say it's lack of uh, willpower and I just have to try harder. And this model actually shows that it's not all about motivation. So if we think first about capability to change, so this is whether few people are physically able to change or whether they feel confident that they can change. For instance, if you've got um, you know, uh, uh, problems with mobility, like, uh, like the man on the picture here, you may be very motivated to increase your walking, but you, might, you may really lack the capability of um, doing as much walking as, as you'd like to do. And also when you're caring for other people and a good chunk of your day is taken up by, by doing that, you may not feel confident that you can walk even if you wanted to. So capability really matters. And then we also have opportunity to change behavior and the opportunity really reflects the, um, the influence of our environments, both the people around us, our family, our friends, our colleagues, and we call that our social environment and our physical environments. And both these slides, uh, these pictures here on the slide illustrate that. If you wanted to be more active and for instance, you wanted to go cycling and you lived you know, in an inner city with lots of cars, um, you may be capable to ride a bicycle or motivated, but you may just not have the opportunity uh, to do so. 
And on the right hand side, you see a park during the lockdown and there was a, were a lot of complaints about people not keeping the distance in, uh, in the parks. And actually, I think that wasn't so much an issue of motivation. It was that it was a lack of uh, green spaces where people could be active. So actually, people lacked the opportunity to uh, exercise and socially distance at the same time. So that's a bit about sort of three key influences on behavior. So I'll come back to those. So we need to understand, you know, when someone wants to change, whether they lack capability, motivation, opportunity, or maybe all of those. And then once we actually understand what influences people's behavior, we can then support uh, behavior change. But it's really important that we use strategies or techniques that have been shown to work to support behavior change. And we don't uh, use you know, the, the strategies that the doctor used in the cartoon, like telling people off and scaring them uh, to death, literally. Okay, so um, I was involved in a very big study looking at uh, what we call behavior change techniques, and you can call them strategies as well. So these are things like you know, setting a goal for behavior change, um, making a, a plan of where, when and how you're going to do it. And we call those techniques the active ingredients of behavior change interventions. Those are the things that we sort of put in our behavior change interventions to help people to change behavior. And uh, for a long time, you would read um, a lot of uh, research articles where you try to work out what, uh, what the intervention or the program actually uh, consisted of, and you'd find things, we gave brief advice or we used behavioral modification, and actually no one had any idea of what, the, what these things meant. So we didn't have, as uh, researchers, a shared language for how we talk about uh, these techniques. Um, so I worked with uh, Susan Mickey and colleagues in the UK and international experts all around the world to come up with a common language, a shared language for how we report in the how we report when we publish and also when we engage with the public, how we report the content of our behavior change interventions. And that's called the behavior change technique taxonomy V1, a big long word. And we looked at all the techniques that were out there and came up with a big overview. And we actually found 93 uh, distinct techniques that can help people to change their behavior. So you can think about 93 different ways to uh, change behavior. And we had an international advisory board who said, well, that's a very long list. So think about how we can, uh, how you can put them in groups. So as you can see on this slide, it shows a bit of our taxonomy. So there's a group on there. Number one is all around techniques that are linked to people setting goals and planning for behavior change. And for instance, number two is all about you know, giving people feedback on their progress and encouraging people to keep track of you know, whether they are um, acting on their goal and whether they are achieving their goal. So for each, for this each of these 93 techniques, we have got a definition uh, that everyone can understand and some examples. And this taxonomy has been taken up around the world. So the researchers are now describing their, their behavior change programs increasingly in, in these words. So we can actually get a better handle and really build up uh, more knowledge about what works and what doesn't work in supporting behavior change. So um, depending on what the problem is, and we I come back here to capability, motivation, opportunity, we need to make sure that we choose the techniques that we know our work, our, our effective at changing it. So for instance, if people uh, lack the capability to change and they feel not very confident, then for instance, we can help them to focus on past success that they've had with behavior change and what they learned from it and what sort of principles they can apply now that they use successfully in the past. If people um, actually do have lack of skills and are therefore lacking capability to change, we can ask them to practice the behavior. I mean, for instance, physiotherapists would give patients exercises to do. That's a good example of behavioral practice. So people gain the skills in uh, changing behavior. 
If motivation is the uh, main underlying problem, we can help people to set goals. So goals that are realistic, but a bit challenging and make them smart, make them specific and, uh, um, and something in a way that people can measure their progress. So that can help to strengthen people's motivation. And we can also use incentives and that's basically rewards for behavior change. So we can ask people, you know, if you achieved your goal, how, how would you like to reward yourself? Uh, obviously, maybe not by eating a big, um, big piece of cake or something that is, is healthy, but people often come up with um, good rewards that they can give themselves. And when the opportunity of, uh, to perform behavior is lacking, we could change the environment and, um, you know, and you can change the physical environment. So for instance, now a lot of the cities are making more space for pavements and for uh, and, and, and wider cycle paths. So to, uh, to increase cycling and to increase walking whilst um, people being able to keep the distance between each other. And if people feel that they are not really supported by the environment, we can, and that's about social opportunity, we can help them to encourage them to find support uh, from family or friends for changing. So that's also an important message here that, you know, the, the behavior change techniques and the strategies that we use need to be tailored to uh, the key thing that's getting in the way of behavior change. Okay, so I talked a bit about what works in behavior change and I'm now going to move on to talk about a research program of which I was deputy director funding funded by the National Institutes of Health Research, which was around very brief behavior change interventions. Um, this was a physical activity promotion within five minutes as part of the NHS health checks and the NHS health checks are offered in primary care. Uh, for anyone between the age of 40 to 74 years old uh, who isn't already diagnosed with a long-term condition or hasn't got hypertension. And uh, in this health check, um, usually delivered by practice nurses and healthcare assistants, they take blood, they measure your body weight and height, um, and measure your blood pressure. So it's a really preventative health check. So we felt it was a really good opportunity in which to uh, build, uh, in which to situate um, very brief advice about physical activity. And we did a lot of work to uh, come up with an inter, with a, a five minute intervention. We tried different uh, types of uh, uh, very brief interventions. And in the end, we uh, settled on using pedometer, so pedometer intervention. And pedometer is, I've depicted it there, it's a simple device that measures simply how many steps you've walked and uh, maybe some of you have got um, um, you know a watch that does the same things but this is a really simple one they cost probably about five pounds and we know um, that pedometers from other research that they can help people to increase their physical activity and this the technique through which this works is self-monitoring uh, uh, behavior we know that if you monitor your behavior you're more likely to change so the, we developed a five minute consultation who was uh, developed by a practice nurse or a healthcare assistant. And it consisted of very brief advice about physical activity, sharing the recommendations, um, um, what people should aim for, handing out the pedometer, explaining how it works and encouraging people to use the pedometer to set goals and to monitor how they got on. Uh, participants also received the booklet that you see on the right with further information and a step chart, which you see on the left, where they could keep a track of their, uh, the steps they've walked. And some people might have monitored that in different ways. And we did a very big um, a study called a trial, the Very Brief Interventions, the VBI trial, uh, which we conducted in the east of England. And we uh, invited people through the uh, primary care practices. I think there were around 26 practices involved. And over a thousand participants took part in our study. Uh, about two thirds of them were female and the mean age was about 56. And um, by chance, people received one, one of the two um, sort of groups or conditions as we call them. So in one group, the participants received the health check and then at the end of it, they received a five minute intervention. And on the other side, um, people received the health check only. And three months after the health check, we assessed whether they had become more active. 
We did that objectively by sending out what we call an accelerometer, uh, which people can, it's a, it's a wristwatch that measured, measures physical activity very precisely. And people also filled in questionnaires. So what did we find? Well, we actually found that after three months, there were no differences in physical activity between the people who received this very brief pedometer intervention and people who didn't. And that might have been because, you know, a single five minutes intervention is just not sufficient to help people change behavior. Um, it may have been that, you know, this, this group, they were quite young and they didn't yet have a, uh, a long-term condition. So maybe they were not that re as receptive uh, to behavior change as uh, maybe older people or people have got long-term conditions. What our findings certainly don't mean is that physical activity uh, promotion shouldn't happen in primary care. We think it's really important that health uh, professionals continue to provide very brief physical activity advice as often as they could to older adults, particularly because we know that people become less active later in life and people with long-term conditions like uh, type 2 diabetes and heart disease. And perhaps, you know, for um, younger people like our, uh, our participants who are still healthy, it might be better to signpost them to smartphone apps. And there's an example here of Active10 um, and or maybe a step counter or local resources uh, such as, as walking groups, which hopefully will start up soon again. So I'm coming to the final part of my talk. I'm going to talk about group sessions to support behavior change. This is a study, as I said, funded by Alzheimer's Research UK. And it's looking at whether eating a Mediterranean diet and physical activity can help prevent dementia. So this is really about prevention, not a treatment. And um, we're, I'm involved in a study, and Michael is as well, which is called the Medics UK study. It's uh, it's still currently running, so it's ongoing. Uh, we have three sites involved, Norwich, Newcastle, and Birmingham. And we have 108 participants in the study, uh, and they are at above average risk of developing dementia. Uh, they're between 55 and 74 years old. And then again, by chance, they get um, assigned to three groups. The first group is a group which focuses on eating, a, uh, adopting a Mediterranean diet. And on the slide here, you can see what a Mediterranean diet consists of. So plenty of fruit and vegetables, nuts and seeds and grains. And you see uh, olive oil as well there and wine, but obviously in moderation. The second group uh, is asked to not only adopt a Mediterranean diet, but also increase their physical activity. And then we've got a control group which receives advice about uh, standard advice about physical activity and diets. And over 24 weeks, uh, both the Mediterranean diet and the Mediterranean diet and physical activity groups receive behavior change support in three ways. There's a website, Leap2, that helps them to set goals for um, eating healthy diets and physical activity. It contains recipes. People can assess their progress. There are group sessions where up to six participants take part with six uh, supportive others, could be a partner or a family member. And we've got four group sessions uh, over the course of the 24 weeks. And thirdly, also people receive credits. Um, eating a Mediterranean diet is a bit more expensive, so they get uh, vouchers to, um, uh, to allow for that. And we use groups um, uh, as one of the key uh, components of the intervention. And as you see in the, in the center there, groups really provide people with social support for behavior change. And we use that in different ways. Um, we're setting, as you see at the top, ground rules. So, I mean, people can be very competitive, which is not very helpful. So we make uh, agreement that we are you know, constructive, that people help each other change. And to foster a group identity, the group chooses a name. In Newcastle, I think we've had the sunny Viking ladies. And the group as a whole set goals, as well as each of the group members setting their own goals for behavior change. And obviously, there's a lot of learning from each other. The thing about the things that worked, successes and the failures and the sharing of learning, which really helps. And in the group as a whole, they review the goals that they've set as a group, but also as, as individuals. They monitor how they're doing over time. And also we encourage them to support each other outside the sessions. And for instance, uh, 
some groups have uh, set up a WhatsApp or a Facebook group where they support each other. And so this is a picture of last year. These are the facilitators who uh, lead these group sessions at the three sites and also the research team. And they have been an amazing uh, team to work with. You can see that was spring last year when we started and we have just finished the, the group sessions. And in the group sessions, we use techniques that are evidence-based. So if we start at the top, we ask participants to choose a goal to work on. They're then encouraged to make a plan. We know that making a, a specific plan makes it more likely that people change behavior. We ask people to keep track of their progress over time. They use the website for that as well. We ask people to review goals, because if you don't review your progress, you don't know how you're getting on. Um, we're asking people to problem solve any challenges that they've come across, um, any difficulties, and not think about you know, not succeeding as a, as, a, as a failure, but as an opportunity to learn. Reducing negative emotions is really important that people don't feel uh, disheartened if they, they are sort of hitting a rough patch. And when things are going well, we focus on making change a habit, building it in people's routines, and really focusing on past success. So our experiences so far have been really positive. I mean, the participants have really enjoyed the group. They kept coming back and has been a really supportive atmosphere, certainly not one of competition, but people wanting to help each other. And we found that, you know, good, good group dynamics and, you know, people, everyone uh, taking part in discussion and groups gelling are really important for behavior change. When, once those things are in place, uh, you're really on a, uh, you know, on a good track. Um, but then obviously in the middle of the, in the middle of our delivery of group sessions, we hit the lockdown and uh, we've done a fantastic job, I think, as a team and hats off to the facilitators and the participants alike, who within a week changed from having those group sessions uh, at the university to doing it all online by Zoom. And I can't, cannot emphasize now how fantastic everyone has been, uh, facilitators and participants alike. And obviously we're now having online meetings with the facilitator team. You see them here on the slide. They were happy to, uh, to share their, uh, their pictures with you. A really great team. So I've come to the end of my talk, uh, just, just as well. We have some time to leave for questions. So my key messages are uh, that behavior change is crucial for healthy aging, that we really, before we help people change their behavior, we need to understand the key influences on behavior. And it's important that we don't tell people what they do. We, we need to support people in making their own choices of what they want to change based on what they value. And finally, it's really important when we support behavior change that we use techniques or strategies which have been shown to work. For instance, goal setting, social support, reviewing progress and building habits. And I'll leave it there. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Wendy. That was fantastic. Excellent. Really great overview of uh, your work you've done so far and also the work now with medics, which is fantastic and hopefully will get bigger. So we have already a few questions. Um, the first question is actually much more about somebody's mother who had a diagnosis. So I suggest, uh, Marty, if you want to maybe to email us at dementia.research at uea.ac.uk, then we can answer more specifically questions on individuals, but it's very difficult in a session like this. Um, so the second question I would, um, is can we have a copy of the 93 techniques? <laughs> Wendy, are you happy to share all your techniques, your secrets? Yes, of course. No, there's nothing secret about it, Michael. Of course, <laughs> uh, of course uh, I can. And so I don't know what's the best, you know, whoever I need to send it to, I can send the, I guess it, the best is again if, if people want to email to dementia.research <laughs> at uea.ac.uk. We put it as well in the chat, the email address again, and then Wendy can provide the, the and we can send it then to anybody who is interested yeah. if you're happy to share it, Wendy. Yeah, of course. And, and just to say that this was, uh, you know, the taxonomy is sort of to probably more helping health professionals and social care professionals to help people change. But I've also been recently involved in developing a similar one for strategies that people can help them can use themselves to uh, strengthen their motivation and uh, 
and how behavior change. So maybe I can share both and people can <laughs> choose which one they, yeah, they like, yeah. Fantastic. So then the next um, question is from Ian Harvey and he asks, when did you have any idea how many people in your VBI trial already had access to a pedometer uh, via their mobile phone, Fitbit, etc.? That's a really good question. Thank you, Ian. Um, actually, no, unfortunately, I don't think we asked about it. And these are one of these things when you finish a study and you think, oh, gosh, I wish we had... Uh, we had found out, so we did just asked at the, the start of the study. And I'm quite sure um, that, you know, some people perhaps in the control group already had, you know, watches and, uh, or may have used them already. And, so, and particularly, you know, technology has, have mo has moved so fast, isn't it? You know, these Fitbits, when we started the trial, I don't think they existed or maybe a few people had them and now almost everyone has got one. So. It's one of these things you learn when you do your research. You think, I wish I'd asked it and make sure we ask it in, in all the future studies around physical activity. Yeah. Yeah, right. I guess in particular because it's so common now for people to have any of those. Yeah. Know? I'm myself wearing one, so they, I should know. <laughs> <laughs> um, great. Then we have another question from Diana Ellis. Um, how much research is exploring a ketogenic diet, which is receiving a lot of consideration now for helping a variety of medical conditions, including Parkinson's? That is a really interesting question, but unfortunately, I'm, I'm not really an expert in nutrition. I'm an expert at supporting behavior change. And I, I wouldn't want to say something that's, uh, <laughs> you know, that's, uh, yeah, I don't know. I really don't know the answer. Um, I don't know if anyone on the panel would be able to. <laughs> to I think all we can say is so there's several kind of international trials happening and we're looking at different diets. I know uh, I'm, I'm aware that the ketogenic diet is one people have looked at. A lot of um, attention is these days as well on uh, uh, calorie restriction diets, um, so intermittent fasting. Uh, but again, if you're interested in this, Diana, please email us and I can forward you relevant information regarding these ongoing studies. But as far as I know, I'm not sure, Claire, you're aware of any results out of them. But as far as I know, there's a lot of studies ongoing. Sorry, Claire Bromley. Yeah, no, I know a lot of studies are ongoing. And I would say also, yeah, please do just email the team and they can find out more. And we also do have those health information booklets to go into a little bit more detail about diet as well. Fantastic. Thank you. Um, well, maybe I can ask a final question if uh, people can think about more questions if you want to. Um, I don't know. Did we have any raised hands as well? I can't see uh, any at the moment. But I wondered, so I can see motivation and uh, capability are a lot about the personal selves, but opportunity is a lot about the outside world, isn't it? Yeah. So is there a difference what, because the outside world is of course harder to change than yourself, but is there a different emphasis you should, you put usually more on one versus the other? Um, my answer would be that all are important. And um, you know, I'm, my work has been focusing on working with individuals and groups. And I think that's only one very small part of the solution. And we know that you know, most of our behavior and our unhealthy behaviors are, are really driven by our, our environments and are almost, you know, we, we outside our, not outside our control, but outside of awareness. Mm. And, and we know that, you know, very powerful interventions are uh, around changing the, the environment around us. And there's a lot of work uh, going on. And they're not the easiest interventions because, you know, particularly just in having the example of, you know, cycling and, you know, changing the physical environment to promote physical activity and involves a lot of different partners and you've got the car lobby to contend with. So, but, you know, in the end, the solution will be, you know, to support healthy behavior change. We need to intervene at all these different levels, policy, environmental interventions and individuals and their families and their communities. Yeah, great. I wonder, Claire Goodman, if you, because I guess transition to care homes will be also a major environmental change for lots of older people. I imagine. Have, have you looked or do you know of anybody looking into that in terms of behavior change, if this can be good or detrimental to people? I think there is research on the transition um, and interesting findings are where actually somebody's overall health and abilities improve 
mm. after admitting to a care home because very often if you if you get to a point where you need a care home things have become extremely difficult so mm. you see an up swing in quite a few people in terms of um, their overall sort of indices of health but obviously at the same time um, the reasons you need a care home is because you have quite com you know you have more than one health condition probably about 70 percent of people will have dementia and the majority are in the last years of life so all those kind of things come into play too yeah very interesting okay we have two more questions they go there coming in now uh, one from Rachel Jackson, um, the behaviours you're talking about uh, are physical behaviours, such as diet and exercise. What about mental habits? For example, perhaps someone's identity might be very bound up with their work, so that they, when they retire, they're left disengaged from society, which might lead to brain atrophy and proneness to dementia. Really good question. Thank you, uh, Rachel. I think it sort of comes a bit to what I said about, you know, behaviors being very strong habits and they can be habits because they're driven by our environment, but also because, you know, we, we identify ourselves maybe as someone who's either a healthy person or, or not, or someone who is socially uh, active or not. And, and I think particularly with these transitions in life and when the, you know, your own environment changes, when you retire, it's actually a great window of opportunity for people to, to take stock and think whether they can do differently. And sometimes, you know, physical activity, I always think such a wonderful behavior. It helps with basically everything. Um, but, you know, if people would like to, you know, physical activity can also really help to connect people with others in their community. Um, and yeah, and, and also in the, in the taxonomy, we have some techniques around identity and helping people to think if they've made changes to think about themselves as a different person. I mean, and particularly when people stop smoking, when they think about themselves as a non-smoker, that is just so powerful. Mm -hmm. um, and also in the medics group sessions towards the end, we think about, you know, we talk a bit about how people think about themselves now. And a lot of people say, you know, I think now think of myself as someone who eats healthily and someone who values physical activity. So there's a change in identity there. So. I think they're not sort of two different things like physical and mental they're they're really intertwined and um and sometimes you know we can just activate people and you know as, as the call me model was showing that the arrow is going both ways so if you ask sometimes people to change their behavior a bit it then can influence the way they think about themselves mm, yeah, very interesting yeah and then we have another question from Diana Alice, uh, who is, have you done any daily positive affirmation techniques to help people with behavior change? Okay, so good question, Diana. So I think this is really about, um, you know, we don't often do that a lot about, you know, self-talk and... Um, Can you just you know, actually explain the technique? I'm myself not familiar with it. <laughs> so what is the daily positive affirmation technique? Well, it's, it's often thinking about the good, you know, about good things that have happened. Uh, and I must say, Diana, you probably know more about the daily positive affirmation techniques than I, than I do. But it's, it's helping people to think in a positive way about themselves. And if you disagree, then please put, a, <laughs> put another comment in, in the box. But uh, yeah, those techniques can be helpful to, to, you know, to self, to motivate yourself to change. If I haven't answered your question, then Diana, then please let me know. <laughs> oh, again, just email us if you want to, and uh, you could, um, yeah, if you, you could also email us again or email Wendy directly if you're interested. Okay. I'm to speak. I think. Oh, sorry. Uh, sorry. <laughs> yes. Go okay. ahead, Diana. No, thank you. Thank you for addressing that. No, I just had some sort of success um, with my mother who has vascular dementia. And I was getting her to repeat sort of, you know, phrases sort of every day. And the, the, the impact on her was quite incredible. Um, just sort of repeating phrases and you have to say it out loud. And I used to get her to stand in front of a mirror and just saying, you know, I am confident. Um, you know, I am happy, um, I, I feel strong, um, I feel safe. And it was just these sort of very simple phrases as a technique um, that I was getting her to do each day. And I did find a big 
you know, a big improvement in her general sort of well-being. Um, and yeah, and, and her has obviously this was sort of at early stages more so. Um, but yeah, I, I just found a big sort of, you know, boost to her. And I just hoped that sort of might be something that maybe other people were had experienced or you were looking at at all. Yeah, really interesting, Diana. Well done. <laughs> yeah, I think I think this really comes back to what I said about self-talk, isn't it? You know, the saying things aloud can be really powerful and in a way uh, can sometimes also with behave, you know, with other behavior change intervention, we found that people say it aloud. It's almost like they commit themselves to that they may not have done if they would written it down or just thought about it. So, yeah, really interesting. And uh, those are techniques we can all use, I think. In particular, yeah. feeling a bit down during, Absolutely. <laughs> especially during these times. Thank you so yeah. much. Thank you. No, great, fantastic. I think I just see we have another one question was in the chat. I wanted to ask how you change motivation in people who cannot be bothered and are not interested. Well, great question. <laughs> uh, my my take on it is like you can't sort of change motivation, but I think motivation is dependent on the situation and what you're trying to do. Um, and sometimes um, a lack of motivation can be due to, you know, lack of capability or opportunity. So they, those were always things I would explore as well. Um, because, you know, a lot of people, you know, said like, oh, they're not motivated to stop smoking. Well, most people who smoke want to stop smoking, but they are not confident that they can do it. Um, so, you know, and you can't sort of, live with this dissonance of you know um not feeling confident and feeling motivated so often people say that's the case but uh again you know i think it's often about you know setting the goals uh right and sometimes people set themselves far too ambitious goals and fail and lose motivation so it's always thinking with a person about what do they value in life and then thinking about how behavior change might help them to achieve the things they value and then setting, you know, even if it's a ridiculously small goal, I remember once in an intervention study, once someone said, I can only swim one lap in the swimming pool. And I said, well, it's fine. So that's ridiculous. And I said that as your goal. And she managed and felt really pleased about it and could then think about, you know, setting more ambitious goals. So, so it's, it's sometimes about yeah, setting the right goals, make them realistic. And sometimes also about asking people just to try something out. And sometimes we get really stuck about talking about motivation. And sometimes we say, just, just try it out and see how it goes. And, uh, and then people often, you know, they perceive benefits that they hadn't anticipated before they, they tried it out. So I hope right. that answers your question. Fantastic, excellent. Well, thank you very much, Wendy. Uh, we let you off the hook now, <laughs> relax a little bit, um, that was great. If you have um, any other questions coming in for Wendy, just keep them going and we answer them later on after our next presentation. So my great pleasure to introduce um, Professor Claire Goodman from the University of Hertfordshire and Claire is a real expert in uh, care home research related to aging but also dementia. So we're delighted to have you. Claire, if you would please share your presentation with us. Can you see it? Uh, not yet. All right, okay. Ah, oh, that's annoying when we practice it. It's, all right, let me just close and try again. I was obviously too confident having done it once. I thought it would obviously work again. Okay, there we go. And, right. Okay, so thank you so much for the invitation. And I think um, this talk is probably a little bit unusual for AR UK um, because this is really about um, how do we enable people who are not affected by dementia to engage uh, with people with dementia to make the experience one of inclusion and participation. And I saw one of the questions was concerned about stigma and nihilism. And really this is what this study is about. So thank you very much for the opportunity. And this is moving from individual responses to community responses. So maybe also touching on some of the ideas of capability um, that you heard before, that if you create an environment that people believe they can change and do and participate, then living with dementia, then we can have better outcomes. So what I'm going to do is just give a little background to the study I'm going to talk about. 
try and capture for you what dementia friendly communities are but actually that's probably the whole talk in terms of its many respects it's a thousand flowers blooming is what we found unpick what i mean by reaching out or bringing in in terms of what are they trying to do to enable people with dementia to feel included to normalize the fact that you have a dementia diagnosis as a feature of yourself and i'm going to take an example of one area that we looked at um, across a whole um, set of domains as to what you what makes for an effective dementia friendly community collaboration and leadership and just sort of talk through some examples and finish with some recommendations and then throw it open for questions thank you so claire bromley gave you a statistic i'll give you the oecd um, diagram of where uh, the united kingdom in is this is a, a uh, OECD countries. So currently, this was 2017, about 17 per thousand population. And then you can see the arrow going forward into 2037 as, to, as we see numbers increase. And so on this, we're about 13th ranked here um, and shouldn't bring any surprises to anybody. But that obviously concentrates the minds of governments. And David Cameron, for those of you who can still remember him, back in 2012, took a particular interest in dementia and absolutely was very keen to be a policy champion that England and the devolved nations should be world leaders in dementia, health and care, in research. And for those of us who've been working in dementia for a while, it was quite interesting to suddenly become very popular, having been uh, maybe not quite so noticeable before. But part of it was also identifying dementia-friendly communities. And the only thing I need to bring out there is that this was a policy target. And although there are dementia-friendly, or as some people would prefer, dementia-enabling initiatives in most uh, developed countries, um, England's one of the few that it was built into policy so and it was following on from Japan and their experiences and it was setting clear targets and expectations. The tar the, this was then revisited again in 2015 and again what with the goals were to be best for dementia research and best for dementia care and support with SARS for, to deliver on that and and the implementation plan included dementia awareness and social action. And, you know, I think this is worth really sort of reflecting that we had, you might not be aware, but for example, one of the targets was that at least 50% of the population in England would be living within the boundaries of a dementia friendly community by 2020. So there were those kind of very specific uh, targets built in. And this also linked on more general work, I mean, that we're feeding into this. We have the Dementia Action Alliance, and this is where the language can get confusing because Dementia Action Alliances in some parts of the country are very closely um, working as dementia-friendly communities and don't choose to differentiate, whereas in others, the Dementia Action Alliance is a, is a coalition of interested groups and organizations and the dementia friendly community is if you like the enactor of those goals but what i want you to look at here is these are a series of statements and i've just given you two here to sort of positioning what it is is the right of people with dementia to be able to expect um, we have the right to continue with day-to-day -day and family life without discrimination or unfair cost to be accepted and included in our communities and not live in isolation or loneliness which i think echoes some of the first presentation from claire which is absolutely what the dementia outside society and ar uk are pushing we have the right to be recognized as who we are make choices including taking risks and to contribute our diagnosis should not define us nor should we be ashamed of it so these are the sort of a very strong narrative from those working in dementia and also reinforced in our dementia policy so we were um, commissioned to do a national evaluation of dementia friendly communities um, and it was a three-year study that finished 
um, back in September last year. And essentially the questions we were asked to address, so the opposite of what you've heard from Wendy about a trial, we are actually looking at what was already happening and being rolled out. And we were asked, what are the characteristics and areas of focus of dementia-friendly communities? Who are they identifying? Where are they located? Who is involved? How do different types of dementia-friendly communities enable people affected by dementia to live well? And what do you need to sustain a dementia-friendly community? So, and what value do they generate? And then finally, can we assess the impact of dementia-friendly communities? And we built into this study the um, development of an assessment evaluation framework so that looking forward, you could really go beyond the descriptive and begin to sort of compare the impact of different initiatives in different contexts. So this was the study design, very um, reduced description. So phase one was essentially looking to see where dementia friendly communities were, who they were, what they said they did, and also linking it to where we knew that people with dementia were living. The second phase was looking at uh, developing and piloting an evaluation tool that originally had been developed for age-friendly cities. So while some, what is good for people who are aging is likely to benefit people with dementia, but it cannot be guaranteed. And so we are very keen, the point was to take the good learning from that framework, but also to be able to have a framework that could differentiate between what is age specific and what is dementia specific. And we piloted that in two very different dementia friendly community sites with very different populations. And then the final phase was we took the findings from phase one and two to base the selection on six dementia friendly communities who were geographically scattered across the country, had different histories, different configurations to understand how they were engaging with it, but also to be able to do some cross case analysis to begin to say, all right, these are the characteristics that are really important when you're a um, a, an emerging dementia friendly community when you're just starting off, when you're developing and when you're embedding. And as part of that work, we included a survey in all of those sites of people living with dementia who had not become directly linked to its organization and management. So we were interested in seeing if anybody affected or living with dementia was aware that they were living in a dementia friendly community. So first of all, an overview of dementia friendly communities and I, I sense that, I, you know, here I am already into I don't know what number slide and I haven't given you a working definition and, I'm, and really there are principles around inclusion, partition, participation and enablement that characterizes how dementia friendly communities are defined and the Alzheimer's Society worked with the British um, standards BSI um, guidance to, to say what would be the key characteristics. But there is also a recognition to say that they are, everybody is working towards becoming a dementia friendly community. And as you will see, this is a fairly loose association of ideas as to how they get enacted. So what we knew before we started was we knew that how many people live with dementia varies geographically and it's associated with age, sex and social deprivation profile of an area. So this we knew. What we were interested to find out is where are the dementia friendly communities in relation to the presence of dementia. So what we did was we m mapped the geographically defined dementia friendly communities and I'll explain that a little bit later because not all dementia friendly communities are defined by their geographical location. So whilst the majority are, there are others that actually are defined by their interests and so like a faith-based dementia friendly community, but the majority identify themselves by a geographical boundary like York dementia friendly community, Watford uh, and so on. So we mapped those the dementia friendly communities against clinical 
commissioning group areas. So those are the areas that are charged with commissioning healthcare for the population. And if you can see this map, and this is where I've immediately lost the whole audience as everybody's looking at yellow dots, which represent dementia friendly communities, um, well, to see where they live and where they know. And somebody will have noticed that there isn't a yellow dot on the Isle of Wight, but I'll come back to that. So, and the color on the map is that basically the darker the color, the higher the numbers of people living, known to be living with dementia. And so what we found, as I hope you can see, that there was extensive coverage with dementia-friendly communities, and that over half of the clinical commissioning group areas had at least one dementia-friendly community that was known to the Alzheimer's Society, or we had been able to find online. And it was significantly associated with the number of known and estimated dementia cases. So the proportion of the population with, but not actual prevalence. So the people know. So we concluded from that, that dementia friendly community provision is consistent with epidemiological need. And they're located in areas where they can have greatest impact. And we were pleased by that because there's so much work where there's almost an inverse care law of where you see the most activity with the people that not furthest away from the people with the most need. So we had hypothesized that maybe in areas of social deprivation, you would have seen no provision or much less, and that wasn't the case. However, all this could tell us was where they were and um, Oh, that's, all, that's basically all it could tell us. Um, but it couldn't tell us whether they were having an impact and it couldn't tell us whether they could be sustained. So having looked at all the dementia friendly communities initially that we had identified through Alzheimer's Society records and online searches, because not all dementia friendly communities choose to go through the recognition process that the Alzheimer's Society runs, we identified at that time 284, of which 251 were defined by their geographical location. So we then purposefully selected a subsample and based on the geographical distribution so that we could get a full um, review of the different ways that dimension where they were located and hopefully how they were organized and did online searches using the domains of the um, framework that I alluded to, to collect data on what they were doing and how. And if the online searches were not very successful, we then followed up with phone calls with the contact numbers. Sometimes there was only just a website and a phone number, so we did do that. And so what we found here was that the availability of online information varied hugely across dementia friendly communities and as everybody listening will know it's often not up to date but this has huge implications for the visibility and accessibility so if you are a person living with dementia or affected by dementia how are you going to find these resources and activities if where will you go and look because dementia friendly communities are not run by our statutory services. They are set up as coalitions of organizations and charities and interested groups. We found that 89 of the 100 had been set up directly after 2012. So if we think of Wendy's presentation, one of the things that we know that, that policy can actually have an impact if everybody, if there is resource put behind it and a sort of a top down validation, then it would seem that that is a catalyst for initiation and growth, but it might not be enough to see it through. And then what we saw very clearly was the diversity in type, size, reach, focus and resourcing. So as I say, there, that leaves us with the question is, are we seeing a thousand flowers bloom, context sensitive responses, or were there some approaches and ways that were likely to be more effective than others? And as anybody who's tried to do online searches will know, there are huge limitations to the quality of the data you can collect. However, just to highlight some things which are of interest and which we were able to capture, one of the assumptions of a dementia friendly community would be that you would have active involvement of people with dementia. It's all about doing with, not doing to. 
and we were able to identify very clear evidence of involvement in about just over 20% of those we looked at. They were on people with dementia, were recognized as on steering groups, they were contributing to strategy and accessible websites, and they were reported as doing things like auditing local services, checking, providing feedback, and so on. In 40%, it just wasn't clear. There were statements about it, but we couldn't get underneath that to see what people living with dementia were doing. And similarly, then a further third, there was some reference to it, but absolutely no references to actually what was happening. And then a very small number of dementia-friendly communities, just three, who were providing services and support to people with dementia and were not actually seeing themselves as having a role in promoting inclusion and participation. So they were the minority. So some evidence that people with dementia were being involved, that this was seen about community engagement and inclusion. But, you know, if a touch point is how people with dementia themselves engage with this system from the online evidence, it was a bit hazy. So this now comes to what I was talking about, about dementia friendly communities bringing in, reaching, reaching, bringing in or reaching out. We identified across these 100 purposefully selected communities, 86 separate aims as to what they were doing, why they were there, how they were going to make their local environment, their local geographical location, or their, as I say, some were faith-based, some were um, business-based, how they were going to ensure that people with dementia were actively able to live well through some of their activities. So there were 86 different aims. Raising awareness was a key aim for almost half, and we recognize that this is foundational, that if you are not um, actually helping your local community to understand what dementia is, and I think Claire's presentation you know, was a, is a classic example of explaining the umbrella term, explaining the kind of um, issues that people with dementia might face. And many of you will be familiar with Dementia Friends sessions and dementia champions and that was the preferred mode of delivery and I'm more than happy to talk about how effective that was um, but nevertheless so it was about raising the profile of um, the people with dementia when they travel when they when you meet them when they use shops when they um, maybe need help um, what are the things that one might begin to think about but we also identified 269 different activities that these dementia friendly communities were delivering for people with dementia or to enable people with dementia to live well in their local community. So this comes to those activities that we classified as bringing people in. So the cup of coffee there is those activities where we run dementia cafes. Here's a safe place that you can come, you can talk, you can find peer support, you can make new friends, you can um, be able to um, just meet with other people who are in a similar experience to yourself. Or activities which were linked to the awareness raising of where it was about how can we make our local community easier to navigate, more inclusive, more accepting of people with dementia. So this is a picture of a bus driver of where, and I think if you can read it, you can see over 300 bus drivers registered as dementia friends. And the kind of examples would be, um, and actually in one of the case studies, that, that had been something that was perceived as being very successful, that people were able just to show a card to a bus driver and that they could be confident that the bus driver would know to maybe just check that they knew when their stop was up and you know, would give people more time and more space. So it wasn't either or, but it, I think what I'm trying to give you, if you remember those statements, how did dementia friendly communities interpret those rights to be able to take risk, able to participate, able to value, able to contribute? And some very much focused on actually making it easier to be in the community by finding safe spaces. Um, and others were more about trying to make everything that happened in their local community dementia aware. And it wasn't either or, but there was definitely a different shift. There were some dementia friendly activities, um, communities favored the bringing people 
in more than the bringing people out apart from the dementia friends promotion work and to link to wendy's talk um well, and so we found less evidence of campaigning for access and inclusion so they didn't see themselves as lobbyists particularly in the main and whilst there isn't really an expectation that dementia friendly communities should do this following on from wendy's talk you begin to see well if a community is working to be dementia enabling or friendly then there is and dementia aware there is theoretically a huge opportunity to also talk about what make for healthy behaviors when you're trying to connect with the wider community but we didn't find any real evidence of that so this is just to introduce you to the framework that we use that guided the data collection for that phase one of the mapping and we then did some piloting of that work in two dementia friendly communities to try and tailor it to make sure that the evidence we were seeking and the outcomes we were identifying were more dementia specific and not aging specific we then took that to a stakeholder workshop a national workshop and sort of said well what would good look like and we had a significant participation of people living with dementia and their supporters there and saying well you know how do you know if something is good what would be your judgment and it was very interesting what those outcomes were in terms of the sort of proxy outcomes of well or the gp practices would automatically offer longer appointments to people with dementia would be a very good measure of a dementia friendly community routinizing how they engage with people other other very specific outcome measures suggested was that somebody when that can be confident when they meet somebody they will be able to engage and have a conversation and that the person won't be phased by meeting them so that then took us to a revised framework where we zoned down the focus of what we were interested in that was dementia specific and we took these to six sites in different regions and i would like you just to look at i'm going to show you all six sites and you will see that the words like business or sports and leisure or uh, local authority or health um, will present in all of them but I think all I want you to take away from this is what became apparent was that they were configured differently and that how they were configured and worked together led to different um, focus different activities and arguably different outcomes so site A was organized their dementia friendly community and all the people who partnered on that were organized around a physical building that received local authority funding that had Alzheimer's society services and a memory clinic so this was the dementia friendly community was cheek by jowl if you like with some service provision and there were networks that had been of people living with dementia and their supporters who had gotten to know each other through that hub who then had de developed further network so it's almost like a um, throwing a pebble into a pond and seeing the effect go out so the local authority councillor there was very important because that was the route to finding funding and then there were health representation and the dementia action alliance that was the sort of broader local coalition of people so there there was this close alliance but it was all focused around a physical building looking to reach out radiate out from that hub site b had a very different configuration similar range of people involved but no suggestion that there should be a focal point for the dementia friendly community in fact they had sold the building that they had had and it was all about promoting dementia friendly activities and enabling activities within every initiative that was happening in the city so for example on the sports and leisure providers they did have dementia cafes in the theater foyers but the idea was that that was a way of connecting in with leisure and creating activities and places where staff could become very comfortable accommodating the needs of people with dementia for mainstream and dementia specific activities similarly with sport running dementia friendly swimming in the main program of the sports center so that it was normalizing accommodating people with dementia the local authority social prescribing initiative was extended and developed to include people with dementia and so 
this and the Age UK work was extended their financial benefits and advice to make sure that they were addressing well the needs. So a very different approach, same configuration of people. Site C was a market town, and you'll notice that some of these are yellow, and was really being run by a very, very small group of volunteers, um, who, um, and it was, and their focus was the dementia cafes, and the Rotary was the source of support. So that was a very context, they were not a big bustling city, um, and really the local authority involvement was very peripheral, and they were very wary of fundraising or seeking for grants because that created various problems about having to set up uh, financial governance structures. Um, so that brought its own um, successes and challenges and the local authorities contribution was in in um, giving rooms and things like that so they were able to connect but they were very much focused on delivering the dementia focused resources to their town site D was very different in that they didn't they had all these people but they had a central group organized through public health where they actively recruited an executive of who they thought could be the most influential. So this blue oblong were the people who met regularly to deliver a dementia friendly community. It was tied in with a public health strategy in the local authority and they had a full time at the time salaried coordinator and the other people were there to bring reports in of how they were doing into that executive. So a very different structure. Site E was a more rural area and where they didn't even call themselves really dementia friendly communities. So they had a regional district dementia action alliance and satellite um, dementia action alliances, all with volunteers who reported in and pooled expertise and learning. And then finally, Site F was a very disconnected dementia friendly community. We actually almost nearly dropped this site because we couldn't find the dementia friendly work and then we realized that they were all working in isolation and then very loosely linked through the local authority so they actually were achieving really good work in their markets um, with the police um, and through very uh, nhs in terms of um, engagement in the hospital but it wasn't coordinated or linked and of course, that all partly ties back to resources. And there is no real guidance about how much money dementia friendly communities should have and what they shouldn't have. So if you could just look at salaried staff, you can see that site C had nobody but had lots of volunteers. And site D had one salaried staff and not very many. Sorry, the crosses are just trying to get volume, then it's not an ordinal level there. Um, but there's a difference as to how many people were paid to deliver this and how many people were in were recruited to support what was happening and then underneath it is the level of support from partner organizations how many were signing up as this is a good idea and how many were actively engaged so i'm going to take the example of leadership and governance and just to show you what we thought were the cross-cutting themes of what the dementia friendly community needed they needed time as you if you remember in phase one it was really clear that some had only just got off the ground and so it's completely unreasonable to set outcomes for something that's just emerging and that isn't always recognized and our framework has developed assessment that reflects um, emer um, emerging, developing, embedding, and what would be a reasonable assessment for differential friendly communities at different stages. That there wasn't a lot of clarity as to what the final goal was. There was a lot of activity in or many of the dementia friendly communities that we observed. But where it was most effective was where there was a person, not necessarily to do all the work but to be the go-to coordinator and link in fact and where it was most effective it's where they were the driver of change they were not the deliverer of the services and this bringing in or reaching out everybody we interviewed was not really driven by a rights driven agenda they were driven by a recognition that it's very hard to have a diagnosis of dementia and continue to engage and keep living well 
However, how that then was interpreted affected what people did. So if it was about providing support, then there was a tendency to focus on activities that brought people with dementia in and gave them places to be safe and activities that were tailored to their needs. If that was translated into these people need to be recognized and supported by all of us, then that moved more towards reaching out activities. And even though we have the policy narrative, it was quite difficult to get that narrative clearly articulated across all those different partners. And where there were people who clearly understood what they were trying to achieve, the link person, it was more likely to happen. And finally, one of the questions that we asked was about sustainability. And the Health Foundation have done very interesting work around local institutions that carry on regardless. And they've caught like the NHS, like local authorities. These organizations do not go away. And they call them, they are a resource and they deliver the, um, in a local community. And we were able to see that where the dementia-friendly communities have got active and reciprocal links with a key, what we call borrowing from the Health Foundation work, anchor institution, they were more likely to be sustained where there was reciprocity. They all had links with local authority, but there wasn't in all of them a sense of mutual obligation. And it also meant that the dementia-friendly communities had access to things to be able to monitor and review. It was beyond the capacity of many to actually do much more than count how many dementia friends they had because of the limited resources. But where they were partnering with what we're calling an anchor institution, they were able to deliver far more and were not as devastated if one of those, the key link person moved on, but it could still carry on. So to finish, reaching out or bringing in, in summary. Dementia-friendly communities are context sensitive. I hope you've taken from this talk that there isn't a one size fits all and they will all be driven by who is engaged and how and why and what the previous history of association has been. But we would argue there were key characteristics which the domains of the evaluation framework um, were, were able to capture that did directly affect their impact, how many people they reached out to and their sustainability. And we suggest that the optimal conditions are about really looking at clarity of purpose so that you can actually explore with people how that need to make a difference, that need to deal with something that clearly is um, social injustice um, across all the partners and how you to build strong networks of influence um, and robust working arrangements with public and statutory services. We think leadership is very important. It didn't appear to need to be salaried, which is possibly quite controversial, but it obviously did help. And involving people affected by dementia was extremely powerful. And if we've got time, I can give you lots of examples of how that changed the understanding of local businesses. Okay. So this was funded by the Department of Health and Social Care. I need to stress that everything I've said is my opinion and not theirs. I would like to really acknowledge this was a big team um, who did a lot of work and we are part of the NIHR Applied Research Collaboration. The bid was brought together through these universities, which um, are all part of the ARC. And uh, none of this could have been done without all those people listed. Thank you. Thank you very much. That's fantastic. Excellent. Thank you for this overview. Um, if you could stop sharing your screen, Claire, that would be yeah, great. Sure. And Excellent. So let's see if we have any, there is a, um, in the Q&A we have, um, uh, this is quite a long, I'm not sure there's a comment or question, but by Katie Foster. So Claire Goodman's PowerPoint is quite a revelation. I've been involved in many, in my market towns, dementia friendly community initiative representing AUK for a while, and it has been a real struggle. We're all volunteers, and although initially there was an, um, Alzheimer's Society paid officer who went around signing up in, in quotation marks, local businesses to initiative. We had no hard and fast framework or targets 
And once that person had finished their year, we were afloat but without having some kind of coordinator, which Claire so clearly says is vital. We are still trying to find a way of delivering something meaningful despite all our best endeavors. This PowerPoint has given me a lot of more ideas and thank you, Claire. Is there any follow-up research going forward from this? Okay, well, two things I'd like to say is that one of the things we, de we developed from, from this work, and I, it, it just doesn't work on a slide, is a logic model to help dementia-friendly communities recognize there is no way we can change the world if we haven't got these kind of resources, which comes back, I think, to Wendy's individual thing about capability. So I don't, please don't beat yourself up um, about the fact that, you know, things haven't happened um, as you would have hoped, because if you, if you are, have limited resources, we could have told you how far you would get until you'd hit the wall based on the study. So that's the first thing. Yes, we're taking it forward. We, we just put a bid in to look at, interestingly, for this session, um, led by um, a colleague uh, uh, to look at promotion of physical activity in dementia-friendly communities as a focus of inclusion, normalization and participation, because there's so much Actually, you know, there's, you know, we, we identified lots of really good examples of people with dementia enabled to still sail, to still, if you ride a bicycle, if you're in a cycling group, you don't have to be able to wayfind if you've got someone in front of you and someone behind you. And it's that sort of those kind of things and, and using football as to promote a collective, you know, joy in the reminiscence of being a well i don't understand football so i'm not even going to try and explain it but you know it the, you know these these kind of innovative well ideas of how do you not make the dementia is not the focus of why you're participating you know and and there are some sports that are particularly well attuned to that like we had one example of where cricket Again, I don't know much about cricket. Doesn't seem a lot happens, but people like <laughs> you can you can sit there a long time and talk and eat and enjoy and 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 the fact that you have dementia is is immaterial. It doesn't affect anything. And uh, so so we are looking. We are quite interested in targeted that. We're very interested in the role of volunteers, um, and that's something that we are exploring as to how do you engage. Volunteering is quite difficult across the board, that this is a dwindling resource for charities. I'm sure Claire will be able to talk eloquently on this. But, you know, volunteers who understand people with dementia and who could really um, be the links. Um, but that's still in development. Yes, I think that's really what I, I took away from this as well as um, yeah, exactly this framework idea. But as you said, it needs to be then individualized for each different location, I guess. Yeah, and, and I mean, I think there is challenge if, if you're only providing safe spaces, but that might be all you can do in your resource. But it, it's but the what we found was that people who were strategic and said we're going to put our dementia cafes in public spaces and make it normal, or we're yeah. going to put our dementia cafes in it as in a part of another cafe, then that changes the changes the conversation. Absolutely. I just wondered uh, as well whether, based on all your work, can you actually create now a national register where these dementia-friendly communities are? It would be quite simple to put, I guess, a website up with, with a map where people could find these, if people, if the communities, of course, want to be listed. But if that doesn't exist, then... This well, is the I mean, theoretically, step. you should be able to find it through the Dementia Action Alliance websites and outsides. <laughs> but I mean, it, it, it was quite striking. And as I say, it was quite funny that the Isle of Wight, well, it wasn't funny, but... Um, I have to say the Isle of Wight does have a dementia friendly community, but at the time that we did the study, it was extremely difficult to find it. Um, and so yeah, there we are. But yes, it's, I, I think I it was more encouraging just to see the uptake, but now the challenge, as I think Katie raised, is the sustainability. And I think that's where uh, one of our biggest recommendations is it is a false thing to do to make this a voluntary participation. There needs to be some accountability in the local community services. Mm. Um, so we have, a, there's yeah. another question by Owen Baker. Um, thank you for a fantastic presentation. The data statistics all appear to relate to dementia friendly communities in England. Is there any information regarding these projects in Wales or Scotland? And is there any reason why these are not included in the research? Thank you. Um, that's, yeah, that's because it was funded by an English funder. <laughs> so, 
Um, so we would have ha very happily got into the devolved nations and obviously in many respects, um, I, I'm not so familiar with Wales, but Scotland has been far more innovative in many areas. So, I mean, that would be a very interesting comparison. I mean, what we would love to do with the framework is begin to identify the types of dementia friendly communities and then match them and compare them because the survey, which I didn't mention, um, that we did, we it was incredibly difficult to recruit people with dementia to do the survey through and that of itself was a finding because none of the dementia friendly communities really have a systematic way of identifying people with dementia so even though we could you know so there was this sort of dissonance that we know how many people there are with dementia we can model it but there was no way of finding them that we so we went through everything we could think of joint dementia research memory clinics and so on anyway we recruited a, i don't remember the number now but we did it was a real struggle and methodologically had some real weaknesses but we've got about 256 people with dementia and what was there was a positive association that if you knew you were living in a dementia friendly community you were far more positive about living with dementia now of course we don't know the direction of travel of that positivity is it because you're positive about it you've gone out and found out about a dementia friendly community or have you benefited from the work of the dementia friendly community and then are more positive well, we can't answer that question but um it's certainly and that's um hopefully that paper's about to come out uh, on that survey so yeah great and then we have another question um which is could local district council help by linking the council run gyms to help with people who have dementia to be more active yeah Absolutely. So that was what one of our sites had done. They had, they, they, they did not see their work as, as, as doing things. It was about, so they were very canny. So they, they, and it was partly because they had a very good link person who was not salaried, but who knew how the system worked. So they got money, for example, from comic relief to promote swimming with older populations and they put dementia in it. So then they could, so then that funded, the dementia friendly so they constantly brought dementia into everything that their partners were doing um, and i think that was very effective but they were one of the oldest dementia action alliance dementia friendly communities mm. that we studied so you know they were uh, much further down the road they had the mindset in a way didn't they then to, yeah they, they, about... they, they and and it, and you know in a way and there was a greater clarity this comes back to the leadership you know yet you know what is driving you you know those rights they wouldn't have articulated it as rights but they would have articulated it as equity and access um and those are very you know and some people who engage dementia friendly communities think that's political and then that you know so it's just you know the compassion is what drives brings people into a dementia friendly community we must do something but it's then how do you take that desire to enable to normalize living with dementia and i, I see is it angelica has put in the chat about greenwich have changed then dementia friendly to dementia inclusive and i think that's absolutely right and you know there is the dementia friendly phrase is seen as being rather patronizing um and you know we didn't define it but that was a fairly strong message dementia enabling um dementia inclusive so we have another question by James Grassen. Um, if we're looking at people affected by dementia, does this include carers and supporters of people? With yeah, dementia? absolutely. Yeah. So we we tried to keep a focus on people living with dementia, but of course it's 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 never one person in a community, and so that was why the per people affected by dementia, and very often it was you know, it was people who the volunteers were people who had personal experience probably had come to an end and therefore they had more time or were working together. Um, and that could be, that could go both ways in terms of how, how priorities were set. And so where the dementia friendly communities had actively engaged with people with dementia, there was a different narrative um, in terms of wanting to, to do more, but um, to, to enable people to go be normalize it more um, whereas understandably very often the carers were more concerned about how do you how do you keep this going you know they have a different different in the personal care great fantastic so we, we don't have any further questions at the moment but uh, if you have any questions otherwise um, please again 
Right, just maybe uh, Lindsay could again post the, uh, our email address in the chat. And the other thing before I let you go into this very warm <laughs> Friday afternoon, um, Lindsay, could you put in the feedback form? So this is an online feedback form. Again, it's just really helping us to share because the first time we, we're doing this, this forum online, usually we have you in person, we have a lovely tea, which we can't have at the moment. Um, but um, just for the future, hopefully we can get, uh, keep these events going. And again, we're grateful for Arts Research UK to fund these events, which is really great. Um, if there are no further questions, then I let you all go and say again, thank you to all uh, the presenters and panelists, to uh, Wendy, Claire and Claire. And um, well, we hope to see you soon at one of our future events. Yeah, and feel free if you have any other questions, want to get in contact with the speakers, again, just email us. So thank you very much. Oh.